immigration should be a frontline issue. Uh, and I think, you know, just a thought experiment, it should be a cabinet level. Uh, it should not, it should not suffer uh, during hurricane season, or it should not be the stepchild to, you know, the, the new toy of cybersecurity and surveillance. Um, so I think for both of those, the takeaway uh, on the sausage making question is um, our movement's deeply naive in, in, in two key respects. Um, who should be privileged in policy formation? As I said, we are overly reliant on lawyers. And then also, um, we're, we're deeply naive about what authorities we should exercise and when. Um, and that we that aggression, um, especially in the defense of the rule of law and our own borders, is is um, at this point is is necessary. Anything but aggression is a waste of time. Howdy, everyone, and welcome back to Moment of Truth, the podcast of American Moment. My name is Saurabh Sharma. I'm the president of American Moment. And this week, it's just me again, because Nick is like five, eight days past due. Uh, presumably, he will have a baby here soon. But to be safe, he is staying in the great state of West Virginia, where his home is with Evie, uh, just in case a uh, baby decides to arrive. So you have just me today, but I promise it is a stellar episode. It always is. But this one's really special. We had on a uh, a friend of mine, uh, Theo Wold, who served in very senior capacity in the Trump administration. I'll get to that in a second, though. Uh, in the meantime, always be sure to check out AmericanMoment.org. Jake is always doing all sorts of fantastic, fun stuff, reshuffling the stuff on there. There's a bunch of fantastic reading lists, Am Canon, of course, books, essays, podcasts, YouTube videos, short pieces, the backlog of this podcast. You can find any events that we have coming up. You can see uh, everything that we have cooking. Uh, we're planning on revamping that site not too long from now, but uh, you know, you can still see the OG uh, for a little while here to go. But today we had on Theo Wold. Theo was the acting assistant attorney general in the Office of Legal Policy at the Department of Justice and the deputy assistant to the president for the Domestic Policy Council during the Trump administration. He previously served as deputy chief counsel to United States Senator Mike Lee on the Senate Judiciary Committee. He holds a BA from Georgetown, uh, where he studied government and English, and MLIT from the University of St. Andrews, where he studied English literature, a JD from the University of Notre Dame. He clerked on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit Court uh, under Judge Janice Rogers Brown and the United States District Court for the United for the District Court of Puerto Rico and for Judge Jose Antonio Fueste. He has also lectured at the law school of the Universidad of Francisco Marroquin in Guatemala. He was a John Marshall Fellow at the Claremont Institute and a Madison Fellow at Hillsdale College's Kirby Center. He is a very credentialed but very, 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 very based man. Uh, you will really, really enjoy listening to this episode. We talk about a bunch of specific synecdoches, anecdotes from the Trump administration of what exactly uh, were some of the problems, you know, even on something like Remain in Mexico, which is considered to be one of the Trump administration's biggest successes, how it was in some cases a, a representation of so many of the issues we had in policymaking in the Trump administration. We talk about the DACA fight and how that was um, uh, mishandled. We use that as a, as a jumping off point to talk about the issues in the broader conservative legal movement, the sociology of who becomes a lawyer on the right and the problems with that and as well as the concept of the multi-ethnic working class coalition, a shibboleth I know for many of you, whether it's real and if the Dobbs decisions hurt Republicans in the midterms. Uh, him and I are both slightly blackpilled right now, I'll be honest with you. News events have caused us to be so, uh, but in an introspective and productive way, uh, there's a lot to be done. Theo's gonna be one of the people doing a lot of it. Uh, he's someone whose name, if you don't know already, you will very soon. Uh, we go now to Theo World. Theo, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. We always like to hear about how our guests got where they are today, and you have a, a windy and interesting journey to tell us about. How, how did you become the Theo old taking names and, and owning the libs as you are today? <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, I grew up in the Central Valley of California. So um, some people will know that as, as Steinbeck country, um, north of where Kevin McCarthy is from. Um, and the interesting thing about the Central Valley is it's probably, arguably, sociologically and then economically, probably the poorest place in America. Um, so if it was its own state, it would essentially rank last on all the, the socioeconomic indicators. Um, teenage pregnancies, uh, you know, uh, college degrees per capita, 
uh, fewest uh, hospital beds uh, per capita. So it's an enormously um, depressed, economically depressed area and has been for, for a long time. So my family I came to California. They were Dust Bowl Okies who left the Ozarks um, seeking a better life in California, which is always the irony of the modern California story. Mm -hmm. People came looking for opportunity and are now fleeing, looking <laughs> for opportunity. Um, and so I grew up there in a very um, a poor um, multi-ethnic area, um, Stockton, for, for people who know Stockton, they'll say, no way. Um, it's, uh, the first majority minority city in America. Uh, it was the foreclosure capital of America before Michigan, before Detroit. And for most of its history in the 21st century, a 20th century, um, an extremely violent place, always uh, per capita, uh, the highest murder rate in the state. So, you know, people from outside of California, you know, Compton, they know Inglewood, but that's because they were, you know, glorified in rap songs and yeah. Stockton didn't produce any musical talent like that. Yeah, Stockton so. was so bad, you didn't have rappers. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. So uh, so I, I grew up in a working class house in in, uh, in Stockton and um, a product of, of California public schools. And, um, you know, I think my first brush with, you know, to, to use language that the left uses, I knew what I was <laughs> uh, before anyone told me uh, because I, I kept having these altercations with teachers. Yeah. And the first one uh, was in seventh grade. I was trying to get into an honors world history class. And I wrote an essay about um, Winston Churchill. And uh, my uh, teacher, or my would-be teacher, summoned my parents uh, to, the, to meet with the principal and her. And they had deep concerns that I was um, quoting and creating like a you know, panegyric uh, history of, of a war criminal, a white supremacist <laughs> war criminal. I mean, people think this, this is, is new, in the right? 90s? This is uh, 90s, yeah. Oh my God. Yeah, so um, California always ahead of the curve. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I think- um, I mean, Winston Churchill war criminal is kind of even cutting edge now. Now, right? Anywhere, really, it's like, yeah. Really, yeah. like bold stuff. She, she, was, she was clearly a, a trendsetter. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's, that, was, um, that was my first kind of a taste of, of the battle lines, you know, where things, where things were headed. Um, and then I went off to, to college at, uh, in D.C. and uh, graduated from Georgetown. Um, I'm and, so sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and the, the best part there, though, was that there was, um, it was an acculturation into sort of the underground conservative movement. Mm. Um, there were a lot of dissident conservatives on campus who had kind of either, they were legacy products of Georgetown, their families had gone there, or, you know, were from large Northeastern Catholic families. So Georgetown was seen as like, this is a, a beacon of, of, of Catholic, um, you know, humanism and, uh, you know, liberal arts. Um, for me, uh, Georgetown was really just, just it was, it came down to one person. It was, it was Father James Shaw, who um, many people in the, the Catholic conservative movement know quite well, um, who was a prolific writer, and but most importantly, a, a really an incredible teacher. So I had Father Shaw for, for political philosophy. Um, and then I fell under the influence of, of another, um, uh, another intellectual that's, it's, been pretty significant on our side in, in, in many of the, the debates happening in the national conservative populist movement, Josh Mitchell. So I lucked out. I kind of fell into a camp of like dissident conservatives and then these sort of great, um, these great uh, minds who were still teaching classical texts. You know, I mean, they were Straussians. So um, there was an approach to, to, to reading and um, to engaging with classical authors that is largely, even then, absent from most most universities so um from georgetown went to university of st andrews in scotland um and uh i i learned to drink whiskey and, and play golf there it's pretty it's pretty much good it. skills to yeah, have yeah right? um were you getting some sort of master's in philosophy or you know so i mean that's that's where like i, I was disabused of the notion that uh i was ever going to be in the academy mm. Um, cause I, I went there with the idea that I was going to, I was going to pursue political philosophy mm -hmm. on, in a, in a sort of a graduate program. Um, and, uh, I started out in the philosophy department and the philosophy department didn't know what to do with me. You, you want to write on Shakespeare through an Aristotelian lens. This doesn't make any sense. <laughs> what is this? 
Uh, so they sent me to the English department, and the English department was essentially like, if it doesn't have a queer studies, <laughs> feminist lens, um, you don't belong here. So um, I ended up with a, a, a master's degree in literature, but uh, really the, the lesson learned from St. Andrews was the academy is, is bankrupt. Mm -hmm. um, it's small potatoes and really angry people. Yeah, um, the, the, the academics there were all very... Um, I don't know if it's disappointed ambition or it's sort of like the the Nietzschean we scholars like they're 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 mining such a tiny area, the minutia of a text that no one cares about. Mm -hmm. um, so I think for me that was that was a lesson learned, and and I always had that pressure in my background of, you know, because I came from a family of carpenters, mechanics, um, farmers. Um, you know, what what are you going to do with all these books? <laughs> uh, how are you going to feed yourself? How are you going to get employment? So my, my grandfather was um, a Pearl Harbor survivor. He was a very practical man. And his his um, dictum uh, to, to me was always, you got to be of some use. And in his mind, being of some use was either being a doctor or a lawyer. So mm -hmm. um, not being gifted with mathematics. <laughs> uh, medicine was obviously out. So I ended up um, going to law school at Notre Dame. And, uh, you know, it was a good time to be at Notre Dame because even though the university was already in its early stages of following Georgetown um, over over the woke cliff, um, there was the law school was um, a deeply conservative in faculty and, and becoming more so. So mm -hmm. people like Amy Koenig Barrett were, were there, uh, you know, uh, Carter Sneed was a huge mentor to, to me. And and the best part of, of Notre Dame was that's where I, I met my wife. So uh, I clerked after uh, Notre Dame on the federal district court in Puerto Rico um, and uh, learned all about what um, the, the sort of decline of the American empire looks in our insular territories. If you mm. really want to see the success of modern America, go to Guam, go to Puerto Rico, where they can't even really keep the power on. Um, and then after that, went to the DC circuit and clerked for Janice Rogers Brown, um, and then fell under, uh, her influence, um, who was kind of a, a lifelong, um, you know, lodestar, uh, for a lot of conservative Californians, uh, judge Brown was when she was on the California Supreme court was like the, the voice. Um, um, and so, uh, she conned me into this idea that if you get a chance to work for a good man in politics, that's, that's worth everything. Um, for her, that was working for governor Pete Wilson. And she encouraged me to take, uh, what was essentially like an internship coming off of a DC circuit clerkship, an internship with, um, with Senator Lee, with Senator Mike Lee on the judiciary committee. And, uh, you know, it's a funny story, but, um, we were at my, my, my now wife and I were at the FedSoc ball. And this was towards the end of um, my time with Judge Brown on the D.C. Circuit. And there were a group of, um, let's just call them establishment lawyers. <laughs> and we were talking as the ball was winding down and they said, well, Theo, um, I heard you were like interviewing for this job with, with Senator Lee. Like, thank God you didn't take that internship. That would have been such, such a mistake. <laughs> I said, I did actually. <laughs> I, I, I accepted it yesterday. So thanks for that. And so I, I, uh, I, you know, were they chastened? Did uh, they apologize? No, not at all. <laughs> no, not at all. Um, but you know, it was a great move for me because I learned, uh, as as you know, you learn the intricacies of how, how Congress works, what it's like to to be um, in in the middle of of policy formation and also like the nominee fights. And that's what led me into the, the Trump White House. So I went from there. I was on transition, uh, the Trump transition, and then I worked for Lee for uh, January 2017 through January 2018, and then went into the Trump White House after that. So um, I think, uh, you know, having done like a mentorship and, and career advice panels in the past, I, I think my thing is always, um, you know, I lived uh, for a time in a monastery. I've uh, had jobs working as a bus boy and a waiter. I think my view has always been take whatever opportunity presents itself and, um, you know, maybe not deal drugs or something, <laughs> but, uh, you know, when, when people say, well, that's not a significant enough position or you should hold out for something better. Uh, my view has always been, um, preparation and an actual ability will, will manifest and the right opportunities will come once your foot's in the door. So, mm -hmm. Um, as you said, it's, it's a long winding path to, to where I am now. But, um, I think, uh, you know, I was, I was, I was told once again by one of these types of FedSoc types that look, uh, the Republican party is not really for people like you. Um, 
it's a party of connections, family wealth. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe just, you know, you can have conservative views, but just say you're a Democrat. You, you'll fit more in with them. And I think for me, the Trump moment and sort of the the populist backlash was, was confirmation that um, something that many people in my background and my family growing up felt mm -hmm. that we belonged, uh, you know, in in this party, in the Republican Party, in the conservative movement, it's borne out to be to be true. Um, so I, I I think um, having the, the the unique perspective of growing up in the working poor, I think has um, has shaped my perspective on policy, but also on this this particular political moment that we're in. And probably filled you with anger at most of the people who twiddled their thumbs in the city while yeah city, while yeah the I mean I, I think I think 2008 was particularly challenging for me. So I just I had just started law school, um, and the the economic recession hit my family quite hard. Um, and uh, in the Christmas break of 2008, um, you know my my family lost their home. We, we lost our home through foreclosure, and for me that was. Um, it was particularly difficult because of what it did to my father. Um, and, you know, people talk about a single income earner providing for their family or um, what manliness looks like in the modern century, but I think uh, in modern America. But I think for me, that moment really manifested that um, when you deprive a man of his ability to provide for his family, when um, the sort of structural edifice of the banking finance system is either is so complex or um, so remorseless that the the repercussions for working men um, go beyond just a hard time or missing a house payment or um, you know having bad credit. It it really can lead to to essentially a, a death spiral. So I I often say you know um, politics is is personal for me. You know my father is what we would call a statistic. He um, you know, he, uh, he, he was uh, killed in an accident in, uh, in 2012, but, um, all the indices were there, um, unemployment, um, having lost his, his livelihood, um, and, and, and suffering through, through addiction. And I think, uh, so, you know, when Trump talked about the forgotten man, which, you know, was lampooned here in DC or the left said, uh, oh, you're not the person to deliver for the forgotten man. Um, whether it actually materialized in a significant way in, in policy choices and policy outcomes in the Trump White House, um, and I think you know, that's it's a, a discussion and a debate worth having. I think just the fact that someone of his stature, um, you know, with the megaphone of running for the presidency, was willing to articulate that there is something wrong happening to a whole cohort of of our citizens. Um, that meant a great deal. So any any question like in my family about is Trump for real or is Trump really going to deliver on pro-life judges or is Trump really going to um, actually get us disentangled from China? I think that all sort of um, that that was those questions fell by the wayside when they had someone willing to speak on behalf of really, as I said, I mean, decades of decline in a place like the Central Valley. So, yeah, I mean, to 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 your bigger point, I mean, you know. We often joke before my father's death that like the 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 slap from from Kamala Harris because she was a part of uh, the effort by the the then administrators in California to deliver um, assistance for those who were you know victims of predatory lending and these things. It was like yeah, so we lost our house, we lost our our well being, uh, economic well being. We were shamed, humiliated among our community, our neighbors, uh, but we got eight hundred bucks. We got we got that check. That's what it was, eight hundred yeah. bucks. Yeah. It was so, I mean, uh, it was all worth it when we got that check. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think, I think uh, I, you know, a mentor of mine has always said cultivating joyfulness is, is an actual, um, that's a thing. It's a discipline um, and not giving over to the less, I think, pervasive inclination, which is resentment. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's, that's a real challenge. Yeah. Um, it's a real challenge. But I, I count myself as, as eminently blessed and very fortunate to, to have had some of the experiences I've had, but also um, to have worked on some of these issues, some of the things that were a part of the struggles that my family went through. Uh, you know, the Trump White House got gave me a seat at the table to to work directly on them. So let's talk a little bit about what that was like. What was the process by which you entered the administration? What was the first role that you came into? 
Yeah. So I um, I was recommended by a friend uh, for a post that uh, she occupied, um, kind of a unique role, and um, she she was going out on on maternity leave, and was really concerned about keeping this portfolio in the hands of someone who was interested in policy but also had a legal background. And so I went and um, and was called for an interview with Stephen Miller um, in January, uh, December of 2017. And um, I think anyone who was interested in immigration policy and working class issues at that time, um, <clears throat> I think it's fair to say like we were all fanboys of, of Stephen Miller um, because he, you know, uh, I still think that the paper he wrote for for Senator Sessions or helped draft for Senator Sessions. Um, <clears throat> it was one of the more important documents produced in Congress in the last 20, 30 years. Um, and if you want to pinpoint a moment where we had an architectural blueprint for what uh, the Republican Party should look like or campaign on, it was it was that document. So um, I, I was hired by Miller uh, and worked for, for Stephen and was sort of a, like a Lynn lease, you know, with the American uh, destroyers in, in World War II with the British, uh, with uh, Miller and Andrew Brimberg, who was then director of the Domestic Policy Council. And my portfolio was uh, largely immigration, but um, Department of Justice, Homeland Security, and sort of those State Department related issues that were not NSC specific. The nexus between legal issues in the Trump White House and immigration is deep and vast. Uh, I think there's a bunch of different stories that could be told about how that actually played out, but there's two that I would really be curious to hear your thoughts on, the first being the DACA fight uh, and the other being Remain in Mexico. Uh, what were those like one at a time to actually be inside the building and what did you learn about how the sausage actually gets made? It feels almost trite to say that phrase, but how ideas, great ideas, actually get implemented. Yeah, I think the thing that's it's important for for people to understand about uh, starting with the DACA fight was that um, in that like Solonichian way, we are very preoccupied with legal process on our side. We were overly dependent on the dictates and the advice of lawyers. So the lawyer's essential argument um, in, in that fight was, look, uh, you know, they promulgated DACA through a memo. Uh, Janet Napolitano put this on essentially DHS letterhead. Dear Barack, I think this would be a great thing. <laughs> Signed Janet. And so the lawyer's view was it will be very easy for us to withdraw this. You you counteract a memo with a memo. And so um, you know the first stage of the DACA fight was was committed to. Um, an interagency process where really no one wanted to own it. No one wanted to be the the, the boogeyman who took away status for dreamers. Um, and so, you know, part of the sausage making is seeing even... Just to explain a little bit on that. Yeah. W w who's the basket of people that yeah. could have owned it, quote unquote? Great uh, great question. So um, you've got the, the inner White House uh, officials. So White House Council, Domestic Policy Council... Um, the senior advisors to the president. Then you have um, the Justice Department. Um, you have some equities at state, uh, but then Homeland Security. And there was a question of, should the attorney general sign this? Should it be a memo authored by the secretary of Homeland Security? And, uh, you know, I think Attorney General Sessions was more than willing to, to go and to go full speed on this. Uh, there were other individuals in, in the the um, the cabinet who were not who who either didn't agree with the policy or didn't think it should be prioritized or didn't want to fix their signature to the document and I I, I tell that not because it's you know telling tales out of school but it it was delay it was delay that ultimately uh, proved to be very costly because now so once we then author this memo and get it out the door Article three came back and proving the lawyers essentially to be um, deeply naive. Uh, Article 3, the federal uh, court said, no, you, you can't take down a memo with a memo. 
You got to do a full rulemaking. And, you know, there was an interim step there where, you know, there was a, maybe you could cure the memo with, um, you know, some additional legal arguments, which took more time off the clock. But ultimately, as you know, you know, when the court, the Supreme Court rendered its opinion, it was, no, to withdraw this program, especially because there's a reliance interest here at stake, people have come to assume that this program is essentially a fixed entity, as if it had a statutory basis. Um, fake it till you make it. Fake it till you make it. <laughs> fake it till you make it. And uh, because we were in the realm of legal process and so reliant on lawyers, the advice of lawyers, we essentially ended up in this place where time elapsed and we were unable to draw to withdraw DACA. And that's to say nothing of the external pressures, right? There's so many people in the Republican coalition were very unwilling um, to, to sign off or to, to be supportive of other uh, administration initiatives if, it, if we were going to pursue the withdrawal of, of DACA. Say, say more about how that pressure actually plays out. Um, I'm sure that there were even Republican officials that were outwardly pro the repeal of DACA that were styming it behind the scenes. What what, what did that pressure look yeah, like from outside? I think you know, one of the, the, the most fascinating parts of the whole DACA experience was there were members of Congress who knew down to an individual, almost like where their houses were in a precinct, what DACA legalization would mean for their reelect chances. Uh, but then when they would do their roundtables in the cabinet room or get behind the cameras would say, any sensible immigration reform has to include, you know, status for dreamers. They came here through no fault of their own. Um, and and that became you know became essentially the maxim that informed uh, the policymaking. Um, you know we pick up a Democrat talking point and then it becomes the thesis for for our policy. Uh, and so Dems you know, are the real racists, but for immigration policy. But, <laughs> but for immigration policy, yeah. I, and I think uh, you know on the outside influence, you would see this with other component parts in the White House. Um, <laughs> where you know they're working on workforce related issues or you know a pro life initiative and groups would say look um happy to be supportive happy to get our ceo to this meeting um or get him to this you know south lawn event um but that's going to be complicated if you go forward with this daca thing um and that's another part <coughs> of of the republican view of policy making in the white house that i think is deeply naive we sort of see each issue as siloed. This is immigration. This is trade with China. This is Chinese infiltration of, uh, you know, graduate programs at universities. None of those are related. But interest groups will come in and very obviously see the connective tissue mm -hmm. and say, look. Um, Today, the National Association of Manufacturers <coughs> is whipping votes for the gay marriage bill. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently, like they know something we don't. These it's, issues are interrelated. It's, it's a workforce way. issue. Yeah, is what I'm saying. Um, <laughs> everything's you know, and, fungible. All policies fungible. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, you look the the umbrella groups that represented uh, represented the um, institutions of of higher ed. They got this. I know you guys really want to get the the spies out. And I, you know, we've heard that there are active investigations on multiple campuses, and there's some concern, especially with the campuses that have. You know, um, you know, federally funded research laboratories. This could be a big deal. But look, um, we're looking at foreign student matriculation rates. We're gonna, you know, take it through the nose if you guys don't get the visa systems back open. Um, and that's gonna really hit our bottom line, right? But inside the White House, it would be like, well, that's a higher ed issue. Theo, why are you here? It's not an immigration issue. We're talking about higher ed. Um, and so I, I think that's part of you know when you say the sausage making. Um, we have a very compartmentalized view of policy. Left doesn't. And that's always operating to our our um, our deficit. Mm -hmm. I think on Remain in Mexico, the thing I learned was um, uh, all this vast assemblage of um, agencies and departments that participate in immigration, uh, the immigration system and immigration policy formation, have no idea what they're doing. Just have no idea. Um, and so, you know, people is that diaspora of entities and organizations advantageous for us at this point? Like, is there any argument to be made that there should be an effort to streamline and consolidate immigration policy making the federal government and the next Republican administration? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I think we're now 20 years on 
the Department of Homeland Security has been an enormous failure. And I think Republicans who are serious about the issues that are presented by CISA, by the cybersecurity dimensions, um, by any number of the failures that FEMA has had over the last few years, the corruption and malfeasance at Secret Service, um, to say nothing of the immigration enforcement agencies, has to look at the org chart of DHS and say, this was a mistake then. Most people who participated in the process of creating it knew that they were doing something that was slightly reactionary to 9-11, but like, look, the political winds are calling for it. Um, and now with 20 years uh, of, of data, we can see this, this agency that has now its own intelligence apparatus um, that is involved in election fraud, um, surveilling American citizens, but somehow really unwilling to enforce the sovereignty of our borders, it needs to be dismantled. And I would argue, um, you know, there were mistakes made in the original creation of the agency. Um, why consular affairs was left, for example, at the State Department, even though they're the ones who issue visas. You know, why would you disaggregate some of these obvious start and end functions? Um, <clears throat> you know, there could be an argument made by people, and there will be, uh, that what you should do <coughs> is grow the size of DHS. It needs more component parts. I think the model should be that we should simplify. And in a, in a modern um, America where we are globally integrated, um, immigration should be a frontline issue. Uh, and I think, you know, just a thought experiment, it should be a cabinet level. Uh, it should not it should not suffer uh, during hurricane season or it should not be the stepchild to you know, the, the new toy of cybersecurity and surveillance. Um, immigration shouldn't shouldn't depend upon whether the president thinks it's important or not. It should be a high level, cabinet level priority, mm -hmm. period. And I, I think for me, my interest in immigration was always that it, it has the most connective tissue, I would argue, with all the other issues. Uh, tell me about your problems in public schools. There's a safe assumption that it has something to do with immigration, mm -hmm. whether it's in rural Ohio, you know, where they're seeing an influx of uh, folks from um, the South Pacific and Central America, and they're having to deal with link language remediation. The um, costs of ESL education are dramatic. Enormous. Enormous. Um, you have issues with administering um, you know, healthcare, right? <clears throat> Probably has something to do with immigration. So immigration is an issue touches on all the other questions, economic development, healthcare, education, security policy, foreign policy. Um, and then of course, it really is at the heart of the central question of what what is the nation and who are its citizens. Um, so I, I think that's deserving of high level prioritization. Um, but but the, the Department of Homeland Security is a failure. And when you look at uh, the Remain in Mexico policy, you know, um, you could have willing uh, partners at DHS or in the Department of Justice who were willing to sort of pursue aggressive um, policy recommendations from the White House <coughs> who were then um, undercut or undermined by Health and Human Services. And I think most people keeping score at home would say, well, what does Health and Human Services have to do with immigration? Well, with undocumented minors, um, the custodianship once they are in the U.S. that goes through HHS. Um, any number of, of health screens or um, some of the programmatic sort of um, assimilation of, of individuals goes through HHS. So uh, to say nothing of, of labor or state or ags, equities in the immigration space, um, I think uh, Remain in Mexico um, was essentially, as I like to say, I mean, it's a WD-40 and duct tape solution. I mean, we looked at the failures of the American asylum system with the knowledge that not only um, you know foreign nationals around the world, but also foreign adversaries know how to game our asylum system. And then this sort of disaggregated mess of agencies that have um, competing equities in that process. And then um, you know with third party liberal groups financing the uh, migration from Central America through Mexico, I think Remain in Mexico was a duct tape solution to, to that problem set. Mm. So when you have this constellation, what can we do? <clears throat> and I think its durability um, is a credit to the ingenuity of, of the White House and many people who worked on that policy. Um, and I think the move by the left to, to see it as one of the first priorities um, to take down 
is is again is a credit to that we were onto something, onto something in in the failures of the asylum system, onto something that the UN and a lot of third party groups are actually actively participating in um, the encroachment on our our territorial sovereignty. So I think for both of those, the takeaway uh, on the sausage making question is um, our movement's deeply naive in in, in two key respects. Um, who should be privileged in policy formation? As I said, we are overly reliant on lawyers. Um, and then also, um, we're, we're deeply naive about what authorities we should exercise and when. Um, and that we that aggression, um, especially in the defense of the rule of law and our own borders is, is um, at this point, is, is necessary. Anything but aggression is a waste of time. Say a little bit more about why like Remain in Mexico was ultimately suboptimal because it ended up being such an unalloyed success. Yeah. Like, I think beyond even what some people expected in terms of cooling the the chaos at the border. Obviously it was highly susceptible to instant, you know, uh uh um return to status quo ante under a democratic administration. But um is it not what you'd recommend the next Republican president immediately switch back to? Well, I think I mean anyone who who has sort of like the 30,000 foot view of Remain in Mexico understands that there are statutory changes that have to that have to happen and i and i realize that's essentially just saying like saying we we should ride around on unicorns um but we should pass an immigration law that yeah. actually fixes the problem at the yeah. Side of the border. that's nice yeah, exactly <laughs> right yeah. um but i think the the problem was um uh, with with a metering solution with the remain in Mexico was um, it, it's only as durable as as the Republican presidency. It's not like those folks were then sent back to Central America or their destination origin countries. It's not like they um, that many of them didn't gain access mm -hmm. to the U.S. Uh, when the policy was still in effect. Mm -hmm. um, so the moment that Trump left office, most of them were just waiting in refugee camps in Mexico. Right? Exactly. Yeah. The deluge opened. So um, it's suboptimal in the sense that it it didn't really do anything to dissuade people from coming, and it it didn't uh, it didn't eliminate the the specter of millions of people uh, who would then rush the border or enter immediately. And then I think the the third piece is it uh, you know the relationship with Mexico has been fraught for you know, decades in various ways. Um, they're probably going to be less likely to to agree to these kinds of solutions in the future, mm -hmm. um, because the you know the the um, the consequences that they've suffered on their border zone have been have been you know, and we can talk about whether what you know whose fault that is um, in the big picture, but um, you're just going to see less interest from the Mexicans um, in in agreeing to that kind of policy or, or negotiating on something like that in the future. Mm -hmm. Not a reason not to do it, but when we look forward and uh, you know potentially into January 2025 and say, "Oh, we're going to do that again," we're just going to have to accept circumstances have changed. Mm -hmm. So it seems like there's a couple different buckets of the epistemic failures in the traditional approach that Republicans have. Uh, one, it sounds like uh, over simplistic legalistic thinking it's like oh the process works this way and if we do the process right everything will happen properly two is cowardice yeah. unwillingness to actually yeah. um uh assign uh, you know to take on uh the focus of the forces of this regime and the pain box they can put you in and then the third is uh, in some cases just actively malicious people who want to undermine yeah. certain policy areas i want to focus on the first one for a little bit um we have a lot of lawyers on the right. And the conservative legal movement has, through a certain lens, been very successful at building up this, you know, praetorian priestly class of yeah. uh, very well credentialed, very quiet. They have nice suits. Um, they they have nice, nice trimmed hair. Um, people over the last 40 years. There's one cut on that that looks very successful. Um, you know, there's been videos floating around recently of uh, some of the legal teams during Bush v. Gore and how they just seemed like they were just on a rampage and managed to get everything done properly. Um, there's other cuts on it that say that it hasn't really achieved much of anything. Where, where, where do you assess the state of the conservative legal movement when it comes to actually being 
a useful chess piece in how a broader political movement implements its priorities? Yeah, I think the answer to that question really lies in um, one's estimation of of what time it is. Like how how late in the Republic drink. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, we were just at a Claremont conference, and if I had taken a drink every time I heard that phrase, um, I'd be dead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, your liver would be done. Yeah, uh, yeah. So because I I think um, look, uh, it's inarguable that. Um, you know, the Federalist Society and some of the key players in the, the conservative legal movement produced enormous victories um, in the nomination and confirmation fights, um, uh, you know, in stalking the federal judiciary, including the Supreme Court. Um, now, I mean, this gets back to the, like, we ride around on unicorns. It could be that we have arrived at a juncture where that's all Congress is good for, Um because the inability to actually legislate and exercise its its powers, especially vis-a-vis uh, the administrative state or, or the deep state, um, you know, maybe that time has come and gone. Congress is just essentially a nullity. Um, so the best thing they can do is just appoint uh, or name, uh, you know, stock the federal judiciary. Um, I would argue that what it has done is create a, a perverse understanding of our uh constitutional republic it's like an old testament kind of thing where we are happy now to be ruled by judges um and uh it's like a live by the sword die by the sword proposition right no matter how good the vetting screen is and we've already seen this in the last year you're going to have trump judges who who disappoint um you know who who do not reach the outcome one would expect or hope for. But how dare you expect an outcome? They're well, simply judges. They're, ju- they're, just, they're just judges. Divining the tea leaves. And, and, and I would say that's, that's the second mistake, right? We, we all know this is a political process. Mm-hmm. Um, but we are committed to a fiction that somehow uh, judges should um, set aside political prejudice or, um, you know, uh, should... should um, be shorn of any ideological commitments, any ideological priors. Um, and that, in effect, is one of the biggest one-way ratchets in in Washington. Um, because that means then a general acceptance of the playing field as the left has constructed it since the progressive era through, through the New Deal forward. Um, so I think, you know, is it a success? Sure. Um, on a certain metric. Um, but it has also created... Um, a very like late Roman credentialed grasping, as as St. Paul would say, a grasping class, um, where mo- most of those who are credentialed by the conservative legal movement are so concerned with being federal judges someday that um, the the Chief Justice Roberts model still holds. Right? Don't write anything controversial. Don't put your your name to a memo. Uh, don't stake out a policy position if if you're advising on policy. Don't work for politicians. Don't work for politicians if you can help it. There's a, a couple sort of reserved sinecures, OLC in the Justice Department, certain general counsels at some of the departments uh, that are okay. Um, but in the main, uh, <clears throat> put your head down and be quiet. And then someday you'll have lifetime tenure. Um, and I think it's less interesting on like a macro you know, political playing field sense and, and more interesting in terms of the psychology, the temperament that that has, that's curated, cultivated in, in our people, mm-hmm. um, that we have a lot of cowards, well-credentialed um, uh, cowards who essentially um, are biding their time till a seat in their circuit comes available. I think I think that's an enormous uh, mistake, um, uh, you know, and it's an enormous byproduct of, of the conservative legal movement that... Um, look, in, in the Trump White House, when we were looking for creative solutions, not illegal ones, contrary to what the left will say, but creative ones, what we got instead were you know, 19th century infantrymen, right? Little finger on the seams of your trousers, march in, march in formation. And, and that's really, um, in many ways, one of the most damning criticisms of the conservative legal movement. It's, mm-hmm. it's stamped out any kind of creativity, any kind of aggression, any kind of will um, to exercise political power. There's this cut on on the cultural issues that that I've found somewhat interesting. I'd be curious what you think. Um, the median Dem lawyer is a trial lawyer. 
Yeah. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're brass knuckle boxers. The median Republican lawyer is an appellate lawyer. Yeah. They read a lot yeah. <laughs> and they, they write flowery memos. Yeah. Um, does that divide explain the difference in creativity and in aggression? I, I think so. I think I think so in, in, in many ways. I mean, our uh, I'm married to an appellate lawyer. Uh, and Some, I assume, are good people. <laughs> yeah, good, good people, good people, <laughs> certainly good people. But it is a monastic enterprise. Mm. Um, it is it is about a commitment to scholarship and and um, honing one's prose style. All all good and praiseworthy practices and disciplines. Um, but when you're fighting Tammany Hall, essentially worthless. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think that's right that, that, you know, Mark Elias, who is now known to everyone, you know, you can go in the middle of nowhere in rural Idaho and they know who Mark Elias is, um, is successful in part because he's bare knuckled. Mm -hmm. And um, he cut his teeth in, in doing... Um, the hard stuff of persuasion and and um, and either gumming up the works or finding compliant courts to move uh, his clients' interests. Mm -hmm. um, you know the interesting angle to what you've laid out here is that it may run contra to some of our co ideologues on what the actual problem is. You know, there's a certain set of people who I like a lot. Um, some of them are my dearest friends who think that the primary issue we have in conservative legal circles is a sort of ideological first principles academic question. You know, are we originalists? Are we yeah. common good originalists? Are we integralists? Are we common good constitution? All fine things. And I'm, I'm generally in favor of an all of the above approach when it comes to blowing open the doors of the Overton window, uh, blowing up the doors of the window. That's not a thing. <laughs> blowing up the Overton window on what we talk about in that field. But it seems like you, you think that we over-index on the intellectual side of this, and it's more to do with a sociological question, like the way that uh, people actually interact and, and conceive of themselves inside the conservative legal movement. Yeah, I, I think that's right. That uh, we, the, the, again, the sort of, the, the temperament that's drawn to, to the vocation, and then the way it is trained and cultivated to say nothing of the legal academy generally. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's pretty hard to get through that sewer without some taint. Mm -hmm. um, I, I mean, intellectual, um, you know, rot. Um, yeah, I mean, so, on the front end, to even get admitted, you have to have a certain level of polish. Polish. You know, no, 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 no blemishes that might scare off a law school admissions committee. But, uh, yeah, an absence of those things. And then also the pedagog you know, pedagogical tools that are used for entrance are... Um, you know, they, they privilege automatons. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, the, the, the creative thinkers usually aren't ending up in law school. And if they do, they don't stay. Mm -hmm. I mean, because being surrounded by 170, 180 type A personalities, um, you know, that's why our... Who are very good at talking and not very good at doing much of all. Talking and indexing their notes and, and putting tabs on their research cards, mm -hmm. right? They would have been team debaters in high school. <laughs> um, you know, so I think... Um, for anyone who did high school debate. Um, so I think, you know, look, uh, it, and, and then when you, you get to the practical reality of governance uh, and the onslaught of the modern left, a lot of these, these folks are really poorly uh, equipped to, to deal with the, the harsh political reality. You know, that not only encompasses losing and losing a lot, but also um, that the the fairy tale story you've been told about the wisdom and, and sort of benign objectivity of Article Three is is a fiction, mm -hmm. um, and their judges are willing to exercise um, uh, authority, uh, universal injunctions, uh, and ours are very reticent because you know the Constitution, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I I, I want to hear the left talk venomously about a district court judge in Idaho, the yeah. way they, they talk, that we talk about, you know, district court judge in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> ha, ha, hasn't happened. I mean, maybe with this... Uh, Reed O'Connor a little Reed bit. Reed O'Connor, yeah. Haney, uh, maybe with striking down the um, the president's uh, student loan plan, yeah. maybe, maybe a little vitriol, mm -hmm. but in the main, no, they mm -hmm. don't. Um, and so I, I think, I think uh, look, uh, given the circumstances of where we are um, in, in sort of the macro project of where is investment needed or where should those dollars let's just you know monetize it the dollars be um directed and invested 
um, training up another generation of essentially Benedictine monks might might be a mistake. Mm -hmm. Maybe we don't need any more um, well-credentialed lawyers. Maybe we need um, you know, <laughs> posters from Twitter. Maybe that's where the money should go. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I, I, th I think the practical question here is really important. Like, how do you get from system A to system B? Yeah. What, what would be the stepwise process Assuming you know some authority over hiring and 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 the ability to construct incentives that we could get from this current pool of lawyers to a new pool that's actually useful. You know, I will say the hopeful note on this is uh, Claremont had um, like a young lawyers conference mm -hmm. um, a couple months ago, and I I was genuinely surprised by the tone and tenor of a lot of the young lawyers present. They seemed now you know obviously there's self-selection in going to a Claremont event, um, but they seemed much more aware of the need to be aggressive um, and, and much more willing to indulge uh, in some uh, creative thinking about how would you strike back at some of, some of the, the left's leading propositions today. Now, they're young, <laughs> so, so many of them will, may reach um, a different professional or um, you know, intellectual uh, realization on some of these things, and um, and be absorbed into the into the blob. Um, but I think in in the main, um, it's almost like the same same question that a lot of the the Silicon Valley VC firms look for, which is you almost need to do personality testing. Like you know, if you if you have a whole team in the White House Counsel's office of of guys and gals who just want to be federal judges. You, you might be missing something, maybe one or two of, of top level, top grade scholars who are, you know, deeply sophisticated in their legal, legal thinking, but maybe go and get a couple of trial lawyers, mm -hmm. maybe, maybe pick up the kid from Tulsa, um, who's spent time, uh, you know, in criminal proceedings, uh, you know, if, you know, either defending or, or prosecuting. And I think, you know, this is a project obviously that you know quite well, but DC revolves around a certain set of credentials. Um, a certain sort of formatting to a resume. And I think the fight that we're in is going to require us to revisit some of the billets. Uh, where, where, Who do they go to? And maybe we have to look beyond um, DC and sort of the, the brass ring credentials that we prioritize here um, to get the kinds of, of uh, uh, the, the kinds of fighters mm -hmm. uh, that we're going to need um, in the ranks. And I'm not saying, you know, you go pluck some guy off of, uh, the Lincoln lawyer or something uh, in his Cadillac and make him White House counsel. But I think there's there's going to be um, a reckoning that we, you you know, your, your strategic and military outcomes are reflective of the fighting force you have. Mm. And we might need to to either re retrain, re-equip. So, you know, in the short term, how do you get from A to B? I think uh, having the conversation, obviously, about the shortcomings, um, but also encouraging um, both members of the Senate um, and uh, some of the oversight committees in the House, but also would-be presidential candidates to think differently about the the lawyers that they're hiring. M maybe go light on Harvard. <laughs> yeah. What did you make of, I, I don't know if you've even seen it yet today, Yale will no longer participate in the U.S. News and World Report rankings. This comes right on the aftermath of I think when all was told, 15 anonymous federal judges saying they no longer intend on hiring yeah. even conservative Yale uh, grads as clerks. Um, do you think that the system of prestige that exists in this country is actually something you can erode meaningfully when it seems to be very slippery like that? Yeah, it's a good question. And I think um, it's one that uh, that will be determined by um, conservatives here in DC. And what I mean by that is most of America, um, you know, outside of, you know, the, the left strongholds on the coast uh, has already sort of abandoned the idea that these schools produce, um, uh, you know, an education worthy of the challenges we confront. Uh, we, we we face today. So, um, so but the problem here in D.C. is people will bemoan Harvard and Yale, and then you know they'll go and send their kids there. 
Yeah. Right. That's the aspiration. Or, ha- hope. or, or get really wet between the ears when they see a Harvard or Yale resume come across their yeah. desk. It's a collective action problem. Like people t- love to talk about, talk about it. They how love to talk about it. And they don't believe in these credentials. Right. But like, A, are they willing to actually level the playing field in their own hiring and yeah. where they send their children? And then B, are they willing to actually like put screws I, you and know, say no to people for I often institutions. asked colleagues uh, who you know who were very actively uh, participating in judge selection in the White House. Um, do you ask them about clerk hiring? And it was always sort of you know poo pooed as well, no, we're asking them about their views of separation of powers and as you said earlier, you know their views on originalism and uh, we asked them to walk us through you know their favorite justice and and why what opinion they said you know but it, but it it is true that. When you hear a federal judge's view of the clerk hiring process and whether they understand what that credential means, because I, I have often argued it's essentially the last credential that both sides acknowledge as being significant. Um, no one cares if you, you know, um, you know, got a Claremont Fellowship or something on the left. No one cares. Uh, no one cares if you worked in the Trump White House. In fact, you know, all the more reason for you to be thrown in jail, right? Um, so, you know, it depends on who the president was that you worked for. It depends on who your recommender and undergrad was, what undergrad you went to. But a federal clerkship, even the left will say, oh, yeah, that, that is something. Um, that's something of value. Mm-hmm. Uh, and with a lot of these federal judges who have come out of the conservative legal movement, so are, they're aware they themselves wanted prestigious clerkships at one time. <coughs> they still engage in this idea that, well, you know, I like to have a chorus of different opinions. <laughs> this was uh, maybe my question is like, it seems to me that a hard no litmus test should be if you're going to play this like silly, you know, schoolhouse rock game of a lot of the really like two liberal clerks and two conservative clerks yeah. in every class. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm-hmm. Um, or, you know, um, I'm really good friends with this liberal professor at Harvard. So, you know, I, I've known them for ages and I, I you know, I, I can trust them to send me their best. <laughs> um, and I, I think, and that happens. Yeah. All the time. It's terrifying. All, all, all the time. <laughs> and, you know, look, and, and, uh, later we'll say, uh, when we're evaluating a, a judicial nominee or a potential assistant attorney general or a U.S. attorney, we'll say, oh, well, they clerked for so-and-so. Yeah. And they went to such and such law school. They've, they've got to be good. Yeah. Um, so, you know, again, the naivete, um, Error and compounds in the system. Error and compounds it, in the system. And and something that's been true of our movement for a long time is our lexicons are really easy to learn. I mean, you know, it depends on the hour, right? What what pronouns you have to use mm-hmm. um, at Yale Law. And they'll, they'll flush out a mole real quick. On our side, we say, oh, you know, I'm an textualist, um, smaller government man, yeah. lower taxes, <laughs> dude. Uh, and it was like, oh, yeah, he's hardcore conservative. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I, I think, um, this idea of like, you know, ask, ask a judicial nominee. So how are you going to hire clerks? Where are you going to hire them from? Uh, actually turns out to be very revealing of more than just, you know, are they equipped to manage staff? Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and really, I think in many ways revealing of, of their priors or how they see their role going forward. Well, and funnily enough, I mean, most of Article three judge nominations, at especially the district and circuit court level. This might not be the case of the Supreme Court. Um, any particular judge doesn't really matter. It's more the macro, like overall, like tenor of the entire conference of judges across the country. And so, realistically speaking, unless they end up going up to the Supreme Court, the longest lasting legacy of any federal judge will be the population of, you know. 100 clerks they graduate over the course of their tenure, each of which has a potential to be a very, very prominent figure inside the halls of power on the right. And so, if anything, it's not only a thing that they should ask, it should be close to the top of the list because it might be one of the most consequential things they do. I, I think that's right, yeah. especially at the at the appellate level where essentially they're they're doing, you know, group work anyway, mm-hmm. you know, committee, committee work. Um, uh, you know, three judge panels are just, you know, glorified um, pods um, that, yeah, one of the most consequential things they, they will do is is credentialing and, and, you know, for the good judges for, you know, and I was lucky to, to clerk for a good judge who was a good teacher. 
Um, you know, my wife had the same experience. I mean, the judge she clerked for and on the Sixth Circuit was a fantastic teacher. And so, yeah, you know, that experience will provide you with um, a skill set or hone your skills in a meaningful way. But ultimately, I think for a lot of judges, you're right, the most meaningful, barring their participation in significant constitutional cases, the most significant work they will do is, is in who they credential. Mm -hmm. So zooming out, the Trump administration had some wins, had some losses, but it did fundamentally change the political fabric of the country we live in uh, and the nature of how these fights are actually going to play out moving forward. What is your assessment of the movement? <laughs> it's a very nebulous term. I, I kind of shudder at the thought of even saying it, but I think but I think it's relevant because um, I'm deeply concerned that no one actually has a plan. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I think you are too. Yeah, I, I, I think that's actually the right takeaway from the midterms. It's that no one has a plan. Um, and I think the more sophisticated way of putting it is to say we've got mismatch between the institutional actors here in DC, this constellation of think tanks and activist organizations that were created in the 80s and 90s, and now the actual party that we have. Um, you know, there's there's very few actors here in DC um, <coughs> who have taken any meaningful interest in health freedom. We have so many, uh, you know, patchouli oil, um, sandal wearing hippies who have uh, left uh, their Democrat roots over the, the pandemic and forced you know, vaccine mandates and are looking to the Republican Party now as essentially, as some would have looked at the, you know, the left in the 50s and 60s as like a, a protector of constitutional liberties. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you, come on, man, you can't make me take that vaccine. Uh, uh, yeah, you, you know, protect my First Amendment rights. Um, and yet here in D.C., uh, you know, you get laughed out of the room. Yeah. And we're still living in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think the the absence of a plan is also attributable to the fact that we've got mismatch um, between institutional authorities and actors and the actual people we now represent. And the way that manifests itself electorally is um, you can't just get a, a room full of corporate executives together anymore at the Chamber of Commerce and talk about their priorities and how much money they're going to give. You actually have to go and meet with small dollar donors, uh, grandma on a fixed income, you know, in Coeur d'Alene and ask her uh, for a $5, $10 commitment month after month, right? And what that looks like then in practical architecture is we don't have the organizational strength on the ground to get these people enthused, uh, registered, turned out, and, and casting ballots. Uh, we don't have the trade unions like the left has. Uh, we don't have like the alphabet soup of uh, assistance organizations like the left has. Um, and yet we've essentially flip-flopped with them in terms of the voters, mm -hmm. right? And so I think the absence of a plan um, is, it manifests itself electorally in, again, in this mismatch. And the way that plays out is, look, I'll, I'll say one of the differences between 2016 and 2020 is in 16, we held most of the gubernatorial offices and state AGs in that blue wall uh, of Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And I'm, I'm not saying that Republican AGs or Republican governors should uh, engage in illegality or tip the hand fraudulently to a Republican candidate, but it's just, it's just basic blocking and tackling of politics that when you hold the top job in a state, there's an organizational strength that comes with that. Mm -hmm. um, you've got supporters, you have patronage, mm -hmm. you you have a system in place that's already produced your victory statewide. You have a set of neutral institutions that have to, you know, just at a very crass level, like put money into your statewide pack and everything because yeah. they want access and that can be used to fund the political infrastructure of the entire state. Exactly. You know, Abbott in Texas banks a hundred million dollars and is able to do stuff with it. Yeah. When you have no statewide elected official in Michigan, what is the pool of Michigan money that you're going to use to win a winning presidential campaign in Michigan? That's exactly right. And then coupled with that, then on the ground, we don't have any of these sort of tertiary, uh, you know, actors like the trade unions, like, you know, the fair housing agency folks or 
um, you know, any of the, the Soros open society funded organizations that do, look, we'll get you food stamps and here, here's a ballot while you're at it, register to vote Democrat, right? Mm -hmm. um, we, we don't have that. So we don't have the macro level uh, sort of, you know, 10 gallon hat and 10 star office holder. And then on the ground, we'd also don't have the sort of the practical um, people, the community organizers, mm. as uh, President <laughs> Obama would put it. So I think the absence of a plan manifests itself, um, you know, on Tuesday in a real way. Uh, and I don't, I don't see, I hope that there are people busily working at this, but instead what I, what I hear and what I see when I get on different conference calls or participate in, in Zoom meetings is everyone's preoccupied with what job they're going to get in January, 2025. Um, Everyone wants to have a theory on what regulation should be struck, struck mm -hmm. down first. Um, it's like picking out <coughs> your parcel of land on the moon. <laughs> at yeah. This point. yeah. Yeah. And there's there's a Meanwhile, lot. Meanwhile, the rocket ship explodes one of the three flights. Yeah. <laughs> We're like pre-combustion, right? Like we we yeah. And so the hard work that actually has to be done between now and any sort of ephemeral January 2025, I don't see anyone lining up to do that. In part because. And then this is a, an idea that uh, is bandied about in our house quite often because, you know, we we decamped from D.C. We live in, in Idaho now, is that there is an obsession on the right with this city. You know, we love we love to decry it and say, oh, you know, Washington is so swampy. and Oh, Washington's not America. But the conservative movement is essentially run out of out of Washington. And I think in order to produce electoral success, we're going to have to start doing a lot of unglamorous work, uh, the cleaning of the toilets, essentially. And that means, you know, field office work in places like Reno and and being on the ground in, you know, uh, the Upper Peninsula in Michigan. I mean, I know every young conservative wants to be here, but to do the jobs that they really want, they're going to have to do the hard work in places that no one's ever heard of. Mm -hmm. Because of the, um, you know, stinging losses a few years in a row now, uh, people end up abiding by a whole bunch of cope um, and one of the terms of cope that i see thrown around quite a bit is the concept that it is complete it is said and done the republican party is a multi-racial working class coalition uh zooming back to the story you told at the beginning uh, you you grew up in a multi-racial working class town uh, what say you to this uh you know exciting notion that, that the transformation is complete the realignment is done and uh greener pastures lay ahead yeah, so um, the first thing is the realignment is not done. Um, just look at the drop-off in white working-class men from 2016 to 2020 in rural Wisconsin uh, and rural Michigan. Um, I think one those, of them, those states are Im important for electoral yeah, kind of nah. right. Just yeah, a little kind of kind of need those. Yeah, <laughs> you know, um, I think the recalibration of the president's message between 16 and 20 on a whole host of um, on policy areas, but just rhetorically, we lost a lot of voters. And I think we assumed that the realignment was complete, and then we could start the outreach to grow the party uh, rapidly. Um, I think, uh, look, um, the challenge is going to be, uh, you know, how how do we, as we were discussing, you know, before we started um, this conversation at the table, um, it's going to be how do we actually produce a sensible, substantively meaningful economic plan that speaks to um, what are really disparate elements, right? I mean, you know, the 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 issues confronting a working class Hispanics in McAllen, Texas, are very different in in some ways, some ways than you know those that confront. Um, you know, Bangladeshi families in upstate New York. Um, I mean, there's some commonality. Um, you know, Republicans still don't have anything of real consequence to say about housing policy. And that's a common thread everywhere is houses cost too much money. Um, it's too hard to get housing near where employment is. Um, but uh, I think, I think intellectually, this is where DC comes in, the think tanks and the aligned groups is, we're still not at a place where we can actually communicate a meaningful, substantively meaningful economic plan that that isn't, uh, you know, some warmed over version of 1980 Reaganomics and isn't just reduced corporate tax rates um, 
and isn't just let the market decide, but is something that will actually resonate with people who are looking at you know inflated prices on a loaf of bread, right? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, the realignment is not complete. Uh, electorally, it's not complete. Intellectually, it's not complete. And then you know we're going to have to confront the same thing that the left is has been able to paper over for a while, which is um, you know when you bring so many disparate elements together in a governing coalition. Um, who gets to decide what's the priority? I was going to end it there, but I have one final question, and I haven't even talked to you about this before, uh, and so I'm very curious to hear your answer. Answer. Uh, did Dobbs hurt us, mm -hmm. and should being anti-abortion be a unifying value of the National Republican Party anymore? Uh, so on the Dobbs question, look, uh, it hurt us again in the profound, um, uh, graft and, uh, I would almost say moral malfeasance of, of established institutional conservative DC. The con ink, what was very evident to me immediately after the leak was con ink had no plan for victory. I mean, one of the things, one of my, my personal heroes, um, General MacArthur, it was often said, um, you know, after, uh, you know, he retook the Philippines that he had already developed full scale the plan that he would do with occupied Japan from, you know, I'm going to bring uh, the suffrage to women. I'm going to create labor unions, all the things he, he planned to pacify the communists, but also to destroy uh, the imperial um, martial state. Um and that's a part of preparing for victory, right? When we win, this is what it's going to look like. And I think the the surprising thing about Dobbs was they had 50 years to plan. And the left raised hundreds of millions of dollars after the decision became final in 48 hours. And we sat on our hands. And the initiatives that we see now uh, being passed in red state after red state are going to continue. And it will essentially be um, a repeat. Perpetual fuel to the them. Yeah a perpetual uh, monetary and political fuel. And it will be a repeat of the marriage fight all over again. We will think we have won and we've got these state constitutional enactments or something of the sort, and we will be defeated square after square after square. And I, I think that's all on um, the, the conservative, uh, social conservative movement, uh, the legal movement here in DC, who raised money for years off of this, but really seems to have had no plan to, you know, to stock uh, state Supreme Courts with jurists that would be amenable to this, um, to counteract ballot initiatives, um, or to have any kind of strategy of how would it interplay? What would the interplay look like between, um, you know, Republicans here pushing for a nationwide ban and and then the long promised um, effort to overturn Roe and return the question to the states? I think um, on the second question, it is still a unifying principle for uh, conservatives to to uphold uh, the value of life. And it, is or ought? It, well, well, now you've, you've you've hit on the precise thing. It ought to be, um, and and I I think any of our friends who who are rightfully concerned about you know genital mutilation and the sexualization of children. Um, should realize that it, it is tied up with our notion of what is a human person <clears throat> and who deserves um, the full sanction protection of the law in our society. Because um, the left is just, they're, they're totally, completely satisfied with, you know, a euthanasia in Oregon and uh, or organ harvesting in New York. I mean, that's that's the kind of dystopian future they they have for for many conservatives. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it is uh, that it ought to be, but I think the evidence post Dobbs is that it is not, that the long espoused um, belief that we should overturn Roe was simply that. We should overturn Roe. Um, and the commitment to, um, to, to life is not equally held, not equally shared by many members of our coalition. And now we're, you know, we're having to deal with that in a very practical way. Um, you know, state legislatures are having to craft uh, compromises uh, between uh, disparate sects. Um, you know, there are there are different significant uh, faith communities in our coalition who do not agree on this question anymore. 
Um, and there are institutional donors who don't agree on this anymore. So um, I think I think it is essential for our side to understand is that the the buck has passed to us now. When the left had to explain its radical endorsement of infanticide, um, it was easy for us all to be on in lockstep and to have a winning electoral coalition. Now, when we're having to explain um, our legal preferences, uh, a lot of our friends are not there. And and I think something you see in a lot of, of the Twitterati on our side is like, you know, this really shouldn't be that big of a priority to begin with. Um, I think I think that's wrong, um, but I do think our our stupidity on our side is is has put us in a cul-de-sac. Theo, where can people keep up with everything that you are up to? Uh, at real Theo Wold on Instagram and on Twitter. I'm new to social media. Um, I in my own. I have a really way, hard time believing that. I just assume you had an alt for a long time, but sure. I, <laughs> I, I really didn't. I I I, uh, I used to give a lecture about what I call pancake people, and the obsession with 240 characters or less is actually I I, I still believe is is uh, imminently destructive to to conservative to conservatism to to uh, populist arguments. You know because they'll always have a better hashtag than us. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm now on social media, so at Real Theo Wold, um, and then uh, you know next year, hopefully, uh, hopefully in, in a position, a public facing position where um, people can keep up with the the work that I'm doing. Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. Really, really, this is awesome. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Hopefully you guys enjoyed that. We certainly went long. I appreciate Theo giving me so much of his time. We kind of yanked him right out of there of the Claremont Conference. Uh, They just hosted a fantastic uh, one for what the new Congress should do. But Theo is absolutely fantastic. Do keep an eye out for what he's up to in the next coming months. I think you'll find some interesting surprises. And be sure to rate and review this podcast. Five-star reviews only, please. We really do appreciate it. It's funny, a couple weeks ago, some of you reached out with asking for the discount code that we mentioned in the Emil Doak episode. So the loyalty of those of you who stayed till the very end uh, is noted, and we are always appreciative. It is even cooler if you give us a five-star rating and review. It really does help us. Uh, thank you for listening to this show as always. We've got a couple more episodes to go before we close out the season here. We're always grateful that you guys listen, and we'll see you guys next week. Moment of Truth is an American Moment Studios production filmed at the Conservative Partnership Center. Our podcast is produced and edited by Jake Mercier and Jared Cummings. Our intro music is A Minor Struggle by Ryan Serenich. Don't forget to like and subscribe on all platforms, and you can go to AmericanMoment.org to learn more. Thank you.